Hey, everybody. Thanks for coming. Sound okay, Rich? Can you guys see okay? Reasonably well? Yeah. Cool. Thank you for coming. I'm Arthur Capozzi. Um, kind of volunteered to help Mark set this up. Some of you guys might remember from last year, we did the big natural law seminar in New Haven, which went pretty well if you guys haven't seen it. Rich Grove was kind enough to produce it as he's here volunteering, more or less volunteering his time with Tragedy and Hope. Uh, Rich, thank you very much for this. Hey, yep. And to all the volunteers. <laughs> and to all the volunteers, thank you. Um, my brother and his wife are over there collecting tickets. So you can say hi. And then Mark and Barb are hiding back there. So. I'm going to try to blast off of here in 30 minutes. Uh, same situation as last time. Last time I just gave like a quick overview of some current events. That's more or less all this is going to be. Um, so I, I'm calling this pattern recognition time too. Obviously I called the last one pattern recognition time. And the presentation is called Signs of the Times. This is very much a... Um, I'm making stuff up as I go, but it's pretty well referenced. It's, a, it's a, like, a, like a stream of consciousness sort of conversation. Um, and the Ebola uh, serum will be distributed in a first come, first serve basis for those of you who need it. The, um, that sign right there popped up in front of where I live in Boston like uh, a couple weeks ago. Five minute idling time fines up to $1,000. I was looking for the PhD who had the proof that this was somehow going to solve something in front of my house, but I couldn't find him. He was just, he just wasn't, he was nowhere to be found. It was terrible. So I want to redirect based on that concept, right? These guys, they, they have solutions for us, big problems and big solutions that they have the authority and skill to solve, right? Remember this guy? Everybody knows the story, right? I'll, I'll, I'll try to encapsulate it just a little bit of a... Oop. A little refresher. Basically, I, I have too much here to talk about. So all I'm going to basically say is none of what this guy pulled off would have been possible without the securitization scam that they willfully set up over 20 years, um, without the full backing of Greenspan's Fed, um, without something called monoline insurance, which was a great big scam. These were the insurance companies that were supposed to be insuring the asset-backed securities and the derivative swaps that were going to be behind, um, that were going to ultimately be the contracts that insured the asset-backed securities. Um, it wouldn't happen without the collusion of the major rating agencies, without the transfer of risk by the mortgage originating banks to underwriters who unbundled them, bundled them, rated them, and then and insured them all triple A. There was an entire value chain of bullshit set up here. Um, and, it, and it covered car loans, student loans, um, obviously mortgages, as you guys all know. And, and everything was you know, claimed to be AAA, and they, they claimed that they had a really nice system set up. And he was you know, awarded for services rendered, this guy. right? I'm just going to read this. The impact of information technology has been keenly felt in the financial sector of the economy. Perhaps the most significant innovation has been the development of financial instruments that enable risk to be reallocated to parties most willing and able to bear that risk. Many of the new financial products that have been created, with financial derivatives being most notable, contribute economic value by unbundling risks and shifting them in a highly calibrated manner. Although these instruments cannot reduce the risk inherent in real estate assets, they can redistribute it in a way that re induces more investment in real assets and hence engender higher productivity and standards of living. Information technology is made possible, the creation, valuation, exchange of these complex financial products on a global basis. So he said that March 6, 2000, over at Boston College in some speech he was given. All right. Basically, he said that two or three days before the NASDAQ collapsed. And if you recall, the NASDAQ had a bunch of tech companies that were trading ridiculously past their earnings per share ratios. It was a joke. All right, we know it was a funny money scam. But just while he had the most credibility left in him before that thing popped, he delivered that statement a few days before NASDAQ collapsed. So he's now calling and telling the market, we're going to move into real estate, guys. 
right? The financial derivatives being no, most notable contribute economic value by unbundling risk and shifting them in a highly calibrated manner. Total nonsense. How could he have already known that? They were designing, with help from brainiacs at Columbia and a bunch of other schools, model systems for developing this thing called securitization, you know, which basically, I'm, I won't even bother talking about what it is. It's not even worth it. The net is, he claimed that information technology was going to have this wonderful effect. Standard of living was going to shoot through the roof. He deregulated the market with Glass-Steagall being revoked based on the argument that basically, um, you know, they needed to eliminate regulations so that the banks could compete overseas. Total nonsense. Everything he's saying there is nonsense. Information technology didn't solve the problem. How do we know this? Derivatives didn't solve the problem. How do we know this? Because a few years later, after that one collapsed, he built up another bubble, which completely collapsed and required this great big, too big to fail bailout. So how is he an authority on anything? How are these guys an authority on anything? How do they have any credibility whatsoever? Answer, they don't. Full stop. And that takes me back down to the picture on the bottom, which was the picture on the front. Five minute idling limit, five is, fines up to $1,000. Who, who's, who is, who's the Alan Greenspan behind this? Who's gonna prove to me that they're indicating a future scenario where they've modeled that if they can control us from you know, having an, an, an idle time of a few minutes and, and one second over five minutes could become a $1,000 fine, how is that gonna in any way, shape, or form solve the alleged problem of, of human-caused human global warming? We gotta start looking at the precedents that these guys set. And then, while we're at it, Bill Gates, man. We're gonna innovate to zero. Zero carbon emissions, no doubt. Oh, that's gonna be great. Just ask Bill. We're gonna talk about Bill a lot in this presentation. Now, a couple of goons at the Rand Corporation state the following. The new proposed environmental protection agency rules aimed at reducing emissions from existing coal plants represent one of the most significant federal actions on climate change to date. If successful, these rules will help the United States meet its goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 17% below 2005 levels by 2020. What do you think that's gonna to do to the economy? Or us? It's gonna be a little tra another little transfer of wealth? That is a worthy goal. But stopping climate change will require the United States and the rest of the world to virtually eliminate emissions over the course of the 21st century, which is already 14% done, if I got the math right. Getting anywhere close to zero emissions demands sustained political and public support, driven by an energy production sector given enough incentives to make carbon reduction succeed. Everybody go check out climate action plans. Type in the name of your city, and, and you'll see this, the stuff that they're pulling. And basically, like, you know, like the front said in the front slide, you know, Boston's gonna be whacking us for $1,000 for having a five minute idle time. It's insane, and it's, it's not gonna work, and it's gonna be a clear cut Agenda 21 um, open door, right? A pathway to setting up Agenda 21, which is well underway. The smart city is well underway. I, I could tell you all kinds of stories about what I'm starting to observe in Boston. So, there's a book by Edwin Black called IBM and the Holocaust. Again, let's, let's talk about the big corporations and the so-called government structures that you know, are supposed to have the wise capacity to judge what needs to happen in our society. Basically, uh, the IBM created a system called uh, Dahomeg. They had, a, they had a subsidiary called Dahomeg where they were designing for the Germans um, punch card based technology, computer based systems which are hardware based. Uh, and it was a punch card system for cross tabulation and in indexing purposes to create census, to, to, to basically utilize um, the ability to, to have control over census data. And it was also used to manage the German supply chain and definitively, as well sustained by Edwin Black's argument, which is just unbelievably well documented, they, they controlled the Holocaust with it. They managed the shipment of people with those machines. Every single one of those major um, centers like Auschwitz had an office, a, a Dahomeg office, which was Deutsch, Deutsch Hollerith Machine and Gesellschaft. So they had their own office, which was basically a sub or an, an element of IBM, where they had engineers that were responsible for making sure that the Germans could keep these things up and running. They had deals all over the place with companies that were with subsidiaries or spin-offs or vendors that were creating the punch cards all over Germany. Okay? And, and Watson knew all about it. 
Watson definitively knew all about it, and Black, you know, all you have to do is read his book to understand that. But again, here we go. Another big organization telling us how we're going to be living our lives, and in fact, acting in the most clear-cut and obvious psychopathic manner that you can even imagine. I mean, it's so in your face that you can't see it. You guys get a chance to read that slide, or would you like me to read it for you? Read it. I was haunted by a question whose answer has long eluded historians. The Germans always had the lists of Jewish names. Suddenly, a squadron of grim-faced SS would burst into a city square, post a notice demanding those listed assemble the next day at the train station for deportation to the east. But how did the Nazis get the list? For decades, no one has known, few have asked. The answer, IBM Germany's census operations and similar advanced technologies counting and sim similar advanced people counting and registration technologies. IBM was founded in 19 1896 by German inventor Hermann Hollerith as a census tabulating company. Census was its business, but when IBM Germany formed its philosophical and technological alliance with Nazi Germany, census and registration took on a new mission. IBM Germany invented the racial census, listing not just religious affiliation, but bloodline going back generations. This was the Nazi data lust, not just to count the Jews, but to identify them. How much did IBM know? Some, some of it. Some of it IBM knew on a daily basis through the 12-year Reich. The worst of it IBM preferred not to know. Don't ask, don't tell was the order of the day. Yet IBM New York officials and frequently Watson's personal representatives, Harrison and Chauncey and Werner Lear, were almost constantly in Berlin or Geneva monitoring activities, ensuring the parent in New York was not out of any profits or business opportunities the Nazis presented. When US law made such direct contact illegal, IBM Swiss offices became the nexus, providing the New York office with the continuous information and credible deniability. That's why Swiss has never invaded. The Swiss are never invaded between that and the banks and all the other stuff. So, you know, again, going back to the theme at the front, these are the guys that are building the smart city right now. So if anybody's confused out there, like, you know, friends of yours that are like, what do you mean? It's, everything's great. You know, okay, if you say so, <laughs> you know. But their, their design and technology across the board, designed to, what, you know, track everything we do. There's going to be microchips in every single product that you buy. You've got smart meters. I mean, you guys are all probably familiar with this. But the point is, well, the point's been made. All right. So we're going to be talking a little symbolism today. I'm going to zip through some of these slides. Um, I kind of like this quote from Oscar Wilde. All art is at once surface and symbol. Those who go beneath the surface do so at their own peril. Those who read the symbols do so at their own peril. It is the spectator and not life that art really imitates. He's saying a mouthful. Speaking of which, this guy's movies are pretty wild. Here's his mausoleum in New Orleans. I actually went down there in the summer of 2011. I walked around the mausoleum. I come around the corner and I see this big thing. And I'm talking to the girl who's running the, uh, what do you call it, the, the tour. I'm like, Whose mausoleum is that? She says, you'll never guess. Nicolas Cage. And I was like, yeah. I probably could have guessed if I spent five minutes thinking about it, you know? Uh, hey, Mark, what's omnia ab uno mean again? I think it's one from many. Remember that when we were talking about it? Omnia ab uno? Yeah. Many from one. Classic. If anybody would like to pick up some eggs, Nicolas Cage will probably be at Star Market. This started to happen in 2011. All the Star Market, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a food chain up in Boston. And they started to, they used to have a normal star. And then right around 11, I started to notice it was doing this. <laughs> and, and then by 2012, 13, they were all like this. And, and it's huge, too. When you drive down the street, it is a massive inverted pentagram. Now, I'm not indicting the people at Star Market. They may have no clue what's going on. It's probably driven from the marketing companies. But, you know, if we're going to talk a little bit about the subversive use of sacred symbolism, which Mark is basically going to be doing today, I just thought this would be a fun picture to check out. And then if you want to go to Poland to pick up some toothpaste, you'll drive into the local store, and this crazy thing will be up there. My brother got married out there, and I took a picture of this. I got a real kick out of this one. It's a, it's, a big, it's a big triangle, but do you see how the strange like orb is actually sticking off of it? It's coming out of it. So it's like a 3D effect, you know? I mean, somebody took the time to put that up there. Hey, let's, let's put a plaza together. We'll call it Suwalki Plaza. Great idea. What should we do? Otherwise, we'll put a big triangle on top of it, a big strange ball in front of it. I don't know. <laughs> All right, so 
I guess I have one question for everybody. Um, do you guys all remember taking a Pledge of Allegiance? Is five years old the age of reason? Because that's right around the time we start. I don't think so. I don't think that kid has any chance at knowing what that flag means. In my view, it is a follow-on to the British East India Company, because this company was definitively taken over by those wankers. But we'll get into that in a bit. Um, but what chance does this girl have? Logically, rationally. Go, go find me some jurist somewhere, some lawyer, who's going to explain to me why this thing even got set up in the first place. Why do five-year-olds pledge allegiance to anything? If I ask my five-year-old niece what the word allegiance means, what, what am I going to get for an answer? Yeah. <laughs> right? All right, so there's this thing in, in 1786 called Shays' Rebellion. Basically, Massachusetts raised taxes to pay war debt, and a flash rebellion started uh, led by a decorated Revolutionary War hero, Daniel Shays. And as Jefferson feared from Paris, a rather unjustified sense of alarm persuaded the states, except Rhode Island, to endorse the 1786 Annapolis call for another convention in May of 1787 in Philadelphia. Here's Patrick Henry's take on this. Remember, pretext, Shays' Rebellion. Just, this is complex enough, but just pretext, Shays' Rebellion. Patrick Henry, June 1788, said, okay, I'm gonna make one more statement. He's, he says the word the Confederation here. He's regarding the Articles of Confederation in his statement. His argument is that the Articles of Confederation were plenty. We didn't need a constitution. We didn't need centralized power. That's what he was afraid was going to happen. And I'm not a statist, okay, but rolling it back to the beginning. The Articles of Confederation basically gave the states and the individual way more power in the constitution. Anybody who says differently, just read Royce's book and I got a bunch of other sources for you on this. The Confederation, the same despised government, merits, in my opinion, the highest encomium. It carried us through a long and dangerous war. It rendered us victorious in that bloody conflict with a powerful nation. It has secured us a territory greater than any monarch possesses. And shall a government which has been thus strong and vigorous be accused of imbecility and abandoned for want of energy? That was the argument that the Federalists were making. Greater danger, allegedly, would ensue if the Virginia Convention rose without adopting the Constitution. I ask, where is the danger? I see none. He's talking about Shays' Rebellion. Why are we rushing to do this? Remember all the pretexts? They've been playing this scam for a million years. I mean, this, this is the Patriot Act is a great example. You know, <gasps> quick, get that thing through. Nonsense. No one, no one has ever given a chance to think anything through. It took four or five years to get the states to agree to the Articles of Confederation. Hamilton, with Washington's help, pushed the Constitution through like that. It took like, I think it was like three, four months. Why then tell us of dangers to terrify us into an adoption of this new government? And yet, who knows the dangers that this new system may produce? They are out of sight of the common people. They cannot foresee latent consequences. I dread the operation of, operation of it on the middling and lower class of people. It is for them I fear the adoption of this system. I see great jeopardy in this new government. I see none from our present one. Public and private security are to be found here in the highest degree. Sir, it is the fortune of a free people not to be intimidated by imaginary dangers. Fear is the passion of slaves. Sounds about right to me. This is Washington. Uh, this is documented right? in letters, I believe, to John Jay. We have, probably, we have probably had too good an opinion of human nature in forming our confederation. There's that word confederation. We're still pre-constitution where he's making this comment. Experience has taught us that men will adopt and carry into execution measures the best calculated for their own good without the intervention of a coercive power. Many are of the opinion that Congress have too frequently made use of supplant, humble tone of requisition in applications to the states when they had a right to assert their imperial dignity and command obedience. Huh? If you tell the state legislators they have invaded the prerogatives of the, of the Confederacy, they will laugh in your face. Get it? They had no, there was no centralized power. And look at the word he uses. Imperial dignity, command obedience. Right, interesting. Also interesting is the fact that Washington's family is related to the Spencer family very closely. I think they're cousins. The family before George showed up here to, to lead this, this effort 
lived on the Spencer estate. The Spencer bloodline is Princess Diana's bloodline. Okay? Lived on the Spencer estate. How do I know this? I can prove this in spade 56,000 times from Sunday. The latest Spencer, Earl Spencer, the guy who's probably only in his 50s right now, I remember the one who spoke at the funeral of Diana. He was in a, in a documentary I was watching on Netflix talking about the thing for 20 minutes. Oh yeah, right, yeah. Washington, she, he lived on our estate, it was great. It's the, well, he didn't really talk like that. I, I automatically break into you know, Mick Jagger whenever I think about an English, you know. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. But anyway, look at the symbolism. All right, look at Washington's symbol. And check out the Washington District of Columbia flag. Right. On 17 September 1787, 38 of the 41 delegates remaining signed in witness whereof. Whenever you hear Larkin Rose say that it wasn't even signed about the Constitution, that's what he's talking about. It was signed in witness whereof. They were not signing as delegates. But as unanimity of the states present, this clever deception hid the embarrassing fact that three delegates had refused to be part of the fraud and illegality. As Lansing and Yates had left, Hamilton generously signed for New York by himself, Alexander Hamilton, who's the wanker who pushed this thing through. A bit of math is illuminating here. The states chose 74 delegates, 19 of whom refused to attend. Of the 55 who stayed up in May, sorry, who showed up in May, 14 left early, leaving 41. Of the 41 who stayed through September, Dickinson had Reed signed from an abstention. Three refused to sign, so only 39 of the 74 chosen delegates signed the Constitution, signed it. 53% of the original 74, nearly half refused to attend, quit, or didn't sign. Ask why he boycotted the convention, Patrick Henry quit, because I smelled a rat. <laughs> it was a group much different from the 1770s. Only eight had signed, only eight of these guys had signed the Declaration of Independence and six the Articles of Confederation. Only six had signed the Articles of Confederation. The famous revolutionaries were not delegates. Jefferson and Adams were in Europe. Patrick Henry refused outright, as I think you've probably guessed by now. Thomas Paine, Sam Adams, Christopher Gadsden, not even invited. <laughs> Pretty good scam. Pretty good scam. You gotta think way more critically about what, the way this country was set up. And, I, and look, for the statists out there who wanna argue that the Constitution can be brought under control, I, you know, that's cool, man. You can, you can work that magic if you want to. I'm not, you can't define authority in nature, so it's not gonna work, but if people, let's face it, even if as, as it exists today, if people were actually, actually cared, even the one that's in there today would probably kinda work. You know, let's be honest, right? We need to take responsibility. But here's this dude. Don't you love that picture? It is the sacred principles enshrined in the United Nations Charter to which the American people will henceforth pledge their allegiance. <laughs> what would Patrick Henry do to this fool if he walked in when he said that? What would he do? Use your imagination. <laughs> Bye. Nice knowing you, mate. A word is not a crystal, transparent and unchanged. <laughs> it is the skin of a living thought and may vary greatly in color and content according to the circumstances in which it is used. Wonder why we got problems. Wrote Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes in Town vs. Eisner, forward to Ballantine's Law Dictionary, third edition. What the hell does that even mean? Mark, you are a man, but under certain circumstances, you may be a lobster. <laughs> <clears throat> Mark Stevens' Adventures in Legal, it's a fun book. Oh, hey, something went wrong with mine. Huh, one of my uh, slides got whacked. Well, we'll worry about it when I get to it. Definition of steal. To take another person's property without right or permission. To take dishonestly. Oxford, American Dictionary. Now compare that with the legal land meaning. Quote, a person commits theft if, without legal authority, <laughs> huh? <laughs> such person knowingly controls the property of another with the intent to deprive him of such property. Without legal authority. What the hell does that mean? Oh, here it is. Cool. All right. Section two, purpose of government, paramount allegiance to the United States. This is Article One, Section Two, Nevada Constitution, otherwise known as public relations stunt. All political power is inherent in the people. Period. Thank you. 
Government is instituted for the protection, security, and benefit of the people, and they have the right to alter or reform the same whenever the public good may require it. But the paramount allegiance of every citizen is due to the federal government and the exercise of all its constitutional powers, as the same have been or may be defined by the Supreme Court of the United States. And no power exists in the people of this or any other state or the federal union to dissolve their connection therewith or perform any act tending to impair, subvert, or resist the supreme authority of the government of the United States. The Constitution of the United States confers full power on the federal government to maintain and perpetuate its existence. And whensoever any portion of the states or people thereof attempt to secede from the federal union, <laughs> this is like a joke, <laughs> or forcibly resist the execution of its laws, opinions, the federal government may, by warrant of the Constitution, employ armed force in compelling obedience to its authority. Oh, man. When asked what he thought about this, that monkey got real pissed and they arrested him. <laughs> A city. I want to say one other thing on the Constitution. Key in on express versus implied powers. One of the biggest complaints that you know, guys like Patrick Henry's had was, they can only have express powers. You cannot pre prevent any, any language that creates implied powers. Well, H Hamilton made sure that there were plenty of implied powers in that thing. Anyway, to go back to this. City, a municipal corporation of the largest and higher, highest class. Valentine's Law Dictionary. Municipal corporations shall not be created by special laws, but by the legislature, by general laws. Okay. Today's new rule emphasizes the dominance of the corporation, a creature of the legal imagination. So a city is a corporation, and a corporation is a mental conception. A so-called city is a mental conception. How do you prove jurisdiction? I'll tell you how. You've got two bailiffs with guns. Valerie Gicard de Tang. This is out of The Independent on 30 October 2007. You can look it up yourself. He was a former French president between 74 and 81. He was the, con the president of the Convention on the Future of Europe, which drafted a new constitution in 02 and 03. Before I read that, I'm going to say this. Oops. The elementary principle of all deception is to attract the enemy's attention to what you wish him to see and distract his attention from what you, from what you, wish, from what you so not wish him to see, General Sir Archibald Wable. All right. Take a close look at that picture. Europe, many tongues, one face. It's probably not that easy to see it, but. The difference between the original Constitution and the present Lisbon, Lisbon Treaty is one of approach rather than content. Otherwise, the proposals in the original Constitution Treaty are practically unchanged. They have simply been dispersed through old treaties in the form of amendments. Why this subtle change? Above all, to head off any threat of referenda by avoiding any form of constitutional vocabulary. But lift the lid and look in the toolbox. All the same innovative and effective tools are there, just as they were carefully crafted by the European Convention. So we wrote it to try to keep you from actually asking any questions and having a referendum to try to change anything. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. If you look closely at that, all the people closest to us are blockheads. Between the blockheads and the Tower of Babel are technocrats with suits. They have round heads, but they're just technocrats with suits. So between the Tower of Babel and the technocrats with suits are a bunch of blockheads. At the front, one of the people is holding a baby. The baby has a round head, indicating we haven't gotten them yet, but we will. All through their symbolism, all these inverted pentagrams. Um, I stole that comment from a guy named Ian Crane, which I thought was very adroit. It's 9.44, I'm gonna start buzzing through some of this stuff. Hypatia and Constantine. Hypatia died in 4.15, she was killed by Christian zealots. Mystery school adept, teacher in Alexandria. Historians kinda of say that the event that defined the end of the classical civilization of Mediterranean Europe was her death. Basically, she represented Gnostics who were a pagan intellectual class operating out of various parts of the Levant and out of Alexandria. Constantine. Oh, and just, just, just to clarify, what these mystery schools, what she represented, astronomy, geometry, architecture, physics, higher learning, okay? 
reason, understanding the mysteries of nature. Okay? Constantine, on the other hand, had different ideas. Right? The Gnostic message had two components, a sacred vision of the earth and a radical critique of salvationist doctrines centered on the Judeo-Christian Messiah. This is why they're dangerous. Especially the Redeemer complex. The Gnostic critique was brutally suppressed because it challenged the core beliefs of imperial Roman religion. Beliefs that have as much, if not more, political unity as they do spiritual veracity. All right? Thesis by John Lash, four components of the Redeemer complex. Creation of the world by a father god independent of a female counterpart. That's nice and psychologically healthful, health, healthy, right? The trial and testing of the righteous few of chosen people. That's, that's wonderful. The mission of the creator God's son to save the world, an apocalyptic judgment delivered by the father and son upon humanity. It is a monstrous error of the mind, the human mind, Gnostics argued, to make suffering into a righteous cause. For those who inflict it, it, for those who inflict it, and a divine redemptive calling for those on whom it is inflicted, is created. Okay. So more to the point. When Constantine forced the vote for the divinity of Christ at the Council of Nicaea in 325, he ensured that the political will of the Roman Empire would be underwritten by divine authority. Humans may commit violence for many reasons. They may seek to oppress and dominate others for various causes, but when dominance by violent force both physical and psychological, is infused with righteousness and underwritten by divine authority. Violence takes on another dimension. It becomes inhuman and deviant. It becomes inhuman and deviant. This was the plan. This was Constantine's plan. This is why they set this up the way they did. Like countless others of her time and in the centuries to follow, Hypatia was the victim of religiously inspired sectarian violence driven and fed by faith in the Redeemer complex. What kind of result? What kind of world result? If the power to dominate and control Others inflicting enormous suffering in the process is sanctioned by a divine being who can at the same time redeem that suffering and release the perpetrators and the victims from the world's evils. Nice way to build an empire. A little psychological warfare. Still working? The United Nations General Assembly strongly rejects policies and ideologies aimed at promoting ethnic cleansing in any form. So if a Palestinian launches a bottle rocket, they get this. The sadists within the church waged open war against pagan cultures, okay, Hypatia time, and saw to the eventual eradication of their age-old traditions, closeness to nature, geometry, astronomy. They also waged war on human reason. The prelates and bishops were affronted by anything and everything created by way of human ingenuity and intelligence. The church deemed intelligent men vain and did not want such men to comprehend and relish their own sovereign power. They wanted men utterly dependent on the authority of the prelates and the clergy. We're going to talk about common core. See if you make a connection. Kristen Schussel's power of the gospel. <laughs> I guess I'll try to say that again. Kristen Schussel's power of the gospel. Check out, check out the confused look on some of their faces. This was captured in a more of a setting where the, the church is now sending its empire out into the North American region. This guy, God knows what he's talking about, probably the Redeemer Complex, and all these people who spend their lives making bonds, oral bonds, contracts with each other, are now told to, write, to read a, a confusing, conflicting book and are delivered, conf, delivered conflicting messages. And they look confused in this picture for a reason. It's because it's a bunch of nonsense. The artificial dehumana... Yeah, hey, Mark, I'm having your water. You get real thirsty up here talking like this. For... The artificial, dehumanized man of today's world is in a terminal condition because his thinking is chronically egoistic and subjective. To his mind, nature is something outside himself. He has succeeded in alienating himself from the spirit inhabiting everything that lives. Paradoxically, it's not nature that is spiritless, but man himself. And you see it. Just look outside. Look where it's heading toward. Post-human era, Agenda 21, smart cities, post-human era. You know, just one little device that, the, um, that has been used uh, against the, I'll just call it pagan element, was to subversively switch out the inherent um, and original meaning of symbols and replace it with something more base um, and contradictory. 
So basically when you hear somebody throw out the number 666, it actually means a ton of different things, but by the church it became evil. And if you, if you think about it, it's a processional day. 2160, 2160 years is a processional day. 216 equals six times six times six. Nine months in the womb, 270 days. The zodiac, like all circles, is 360 degrees. The sun, the number for the sun, the esoteric number for the sun, 36, added up, 666. Human genome made up of 23 chromosomes, two divided by three, 666. The famous number of the beast refers to man. Man is the beast of John's revelation. Think about that. See how they switched it up? It's got nothing to do with nature. Man is evil. He's a beast. It's exactly what's, what they want you thinking. And we're going to start acting that way if we start letting Bill Gates run the education system. Flat out, full stop. Totally outcome based. They're going to have di data mining centers are already being built. Everything your kids, everything data mined. Special centers designed to track everything for the kids are being built in this country and brought online. Uh, Common Core consists of hypersexualization and, and sexual confusion of sexuality, thorough dumbing down of math and English. It's unbelievable. Lobbyists paid by Bill and Melinda Gates. Material is copyrighted. Funded by Bill and Melinda Gates. Gates confessed that their foundation has spent $2.5 billion. The 2010 copyright belongs to NGA Center CCSSO. Shall be acknowledged as sole owner and developer of the Common Core st State Standard. No claim to the contrary shall be made, so it's a private concept funded by Bill and Melinda Gates. Okay? They've got the copyright. Right. Here's, here's a sign that hangs up in one of the schools. How do people, oh, by the way, this is coming out of a, um, Dr. Duke Pesta's presentation on Common Core, which I'm sure a fair number of you have probably heard of. How do people feel express, how do people express their sexual feelings? Look at the shit that's on that screen. Caressing, misspelled. They misspelled caressing, it's now caressing. <laughs> <clears throat> this uh, poster hung in a sixth grade class in Shawnee, Kansas. National sexual education standards folded into all curriculums through Common Core and English and even math. So, English and math. For six year olds, seven year olds learning math, you know, Jenny's two daddies each have an apple. They actually have to Im implant that in the curriculum for math and English. We're not just talking about a separate sexual curriculum. It's crazy. Anyway, the, the response from Leanne Neal in Shawnee, Kansas, who can't apparently think. The curriculum it is a part of, referring to the sign, aligns with the national standards around those topics, and it's part of our curriculum in those school districts. That's her response to a parent who was pissed. Okay, so I gotta go to 107. I'm gonna show you a little bit of the Common Core presentation, then I'll wrap up within like five minutes. I'm gonna go through English, math, sex ed, and masturbation. 107. Must be the hookup. Right. Now let's talk briefly about math. As William said, this will in no way prepare kids for college math. Where, as Milgram put it, where are your architecture engineers, your doctors going to come from? STEM, you know, uh, do you all know what STEM is? STEM is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. That's what people who care about math curriculum and standards care about. Are they STEM worthy? Will, they pre will American math prepare kids for careers in science, technology, engineering, and math? STEM, will they? Uh, Milgram says absolutely categorically, categorically this curriculum will not. In fact, here's another name for you. Remember I mentioned those five people besides David Coleman? Here's another one you should write down. Jason Zimba, Z-I-M-B-A. He is the man single-handedly responsible for the math standards. And he admitted in a very recent interview, you should double check this too. He admitted in a very recent interview when pushed on this that yes, it's true. Common Core math will not prepare kids for college math. He said at best, it might, in the best circumstances, prepare them for a two-year technical college, but not for college. That's the guy who wrote the standards, Jason Zimba. Look him up, right? And so in talking to people like Jim Milgram and talking to people who've done this kind of standards work, the argument, uh, trying to find out why, well, then what is the purpose of Common Core math if it's not to get our kids college ready for math? What's the purpose? I was directed by them to this video. It's a short clip. This young woman, she is a community organizer in Chicago. You cannot make that up. 
right? And she's talking to a group of Illinois high school math teachers about what the philosophy of Common Core math is. And here's what she says. But even under the new Common Core, if even if they said three times four was 11, if they were able to explain their reasoning and explain how they came up with their answer really in um, words and in oral explanations, and they showed it in the picture, but they just got the final number wrong, we're really more focusing on the how and the way to be correcting them. And over and over again, that's what the people on the committee said. That when we tried to get to the bottom of what in the world this was about, that's it. It's not about right answers. The right answer is absolutely subordinate to making people feel comfortable about math. Making them comfortable. Now, a little background history. When I was in third grade, I actually had like a college level, introductory college level reading. This guy is ability. awesome. I don't know why Anybody who hasn't checked it out, it's just brilliant. What's his name again? Dr. Duke Pesta, and that's a two hour, come on, that's a two hour presentation on YouTube. I'll give you one more. Um, the sex ed one is just it's a freak show. I'll, I'll go to math. Little boy wrote six times seven. It's a third grader. It's a multiplication question. Six times seven, he wrote 42. He got it marked wrong. And there was a note from his teacher in red pencil that the other two children in his pair group agreed on a different answer. They got it marked right because they agreed. He got it marked wrong, even though he had the right answer because he did not agree with the other two people in his group. We have another kid who, in a simple addition question, the answer was 111. He got it marked wrong because he wrote 111. And he got it marked wrong because he didn't draw in the box provided 111 circles. That was the only acceptable way to answer the question, draw 111 circles. This next clip was given to me by the same people, and they pointed this out to me. They said, look, this is exactly what goes on in Common Core Math. And there are thousands, I'm going to show you a short clip of a little girl working in Common Core Math. There are thousands of these clips on the internet. Any of you got kids in Common Core Math right now? One of the staggering things is, is that, can you help your kid with their math homework? Yeah. You can? Yeah. How, how did you figure out the Common Core way? <laughs> you, you, well, I'm going to show you this. This, this, this woman is a, uh, a mom right, with a lot of math background who can't help her kid. I've got a doctor in Green Bay. She took calculus in eighth grade. She, she's one of the only women ever, one of the only doctors ever to ace to complete the math section, 100, complete 100% on the math boards for, for her, her pre-med. She can't help her fifth grader with math, not because she doesn't know the math, but because of all this weird way they have to do it. This video was given to me by the people on the committee, and they said, look, look at this. This is exactly the problem you have with Common Core Math. So watch this. It's a, a simple addition question. Take Great. So what I want you to do is, can you solve that problem showing me the way that you learned how to solve it in school? Okay. And talk to me while you're solving it. So we learned that a big square like this it's a hundred. So we could make that hundred into a cube, which would make a thousand. So I'm going to do that. Oh, no. So let's just say that's a thousand. Mm -hmm. And now we ha we still have to do five hundred. Could we that into five sheets? They're drawing squares for numbers, and they have to answer this way. And we have sixty, which are just lines. Okay. Look at the squares. Okay. See the the remainder of lines. Birthday. This is what Gates wants. more. 
I'm telling you, they're dumb in the country now. <laughs> you just saw took about eight minutes. Yeah, okay. that's what we're doing in school. But at home, I'm taught how to stack. And we're not allowed to do stacking in school. That's why we have to figure it out that way. Okay. Not allowed to do it. So I'm going to stack these numbers, which is way easy. Which is way easy. Now, look, check this out. What are you thinking? You're looking at your problems. This is great. You got two different answers. You got two different answers. Two different answers. What do you think happened? Maybe I counted wrong. Looks like you did the stacking correctly. And that took you about a minute. So I think I did something messed up in on the sheets. Out of the mouths of babes, right? Out of the mouths of babes. Look. Do you understand how this way of doing These math, people and I gotta tell it. you, it's the thing that's so frustrating about and, Common Core math. I mean, certainly it's making it easier for guys like me who are like, um, the technocrats are trying to basically ruin the country. It's, you can now point them, if you can just get somebody to sit down long enough and, and understand what this stuff is and see it, you can't lose the argument, you know what I mean? And I put this up because just a couple, I'll, I'll go fast, Rich. Because just a couple you know, days after I saw this, and I didn't show you the sexualization section where he breaks it all down, it's a total freak show. But I, a couple days after watching him go through it, one, one of the elements was now new schools need to be built. And I'm talking about for little kids. Little kids, grade school kids. They're gonna have a men's room, sorry, a boys room, a girls room, and like a transgender room for bathrooms. These kids are too young, they don't, they don't, they're not thinking about this stuff. Why are they, why are they jamming it down their throat? And then like two days later, I see this. Every time I go check my email, it's like, let's have another trauma. You know, let's have another falsification or fabrication. You know, this one was great. I just like this one because what the fuck is that? And what are those two kids? What is it? Two little boys that are approximately eight with red bow ties dressed the same, having some sort of cuddly moment. And this is now the art, this, this is implanting the reason why we're gonna be seeing transgender bathrooms in school, I guarantee you, that is why this, I'm not, sorry, preaching to the choir, but that's why this stuff gets up on there. But hey, don't worry about it, man. This guy loves you. It's all in the eyes, you know? There's Bezos up on the top right, Bilderberg attendee, Bill, mega technocrat, zero emissions, <laughs> eliminating normal stacking counting in school. This, this guy's got his hand in everything. Real healthy looking dude. He's also in vaccines, which he's working with the Rotary Club on. You know, it's the infiltration model. Rotary Club? Yeah, let's, let's work the vaccine angle. We're this close to ending polio, because he really cares. There's so much evidence to support that. Okay, I'm gonna cruise through a couple things here. Teacher quits, no class forever. Top right, school district police, stock up on free military gear. Here is, uh, a, uh, this is engraved into a building in Yale, New Haven. Mark, myself, and Barb took this picture. I think, photo courtesy Barb Passio. But anyway, she took it, and we were hanging around, you know, Yale the night before we had the natural law seminar. Anybody, can I get a volunteer to tell me what that is? What they see? So if you, if you can't see it too well, you know, feel free to come closer. Whoever wants to volunteer, I don't think the whole group should move up. Might be it. Logistical problem. It's a little hard to see. So I'll, I'll, hey Mark, you know what? Can you walk us through what that looks like to you? This is an, on a building where people are supposed to be educated. 
this is on a Yale law school building. Yep. It's uh, supposed to be a student who has passed out because he's gone through a labyrinth of law books and there's cobwebs growing all around him. He's, uh, you know, basically passed out with books around him and contorted and, uh, you know, drink in his hands and, and you know, he's basically uh, completely exhausted from trying to navigate the labyrinth of, of man's law. And on the left, you've got an owl embedded in there. And on the right, you've got some nasty little creature. And then you've got a spider up on the top. Oh. These people are walking underneath the symbolism, the real symbolism of the action at Yale, which I talked about, you know, in the last presentation. So by the time you're done with Common Core and your kids who, you know, your ego drive says, I gotta send my kid to Yale without thinking critically what you're sending your kid to go do. They go walk underneath that sign and what happens when popular mechanics starts trying to make so-called scientific claims about what happened on 9-11 on of the buildings? Total bullshit, everything here. Full stop, full stop. What they did was they, it's a long story, I'm not gonna have time to go into it, but what they basically did was take a preliminary report from the, National Institute of Stand from the National Institute of Standards and Technology, preliminary report, thesis one. They, they said that that was the end all of what happened to the buildings. Then when NIST changed the story at least two more times, and I think a third a few years later, I believe that there have been three new hypotheses to describe what happened to Trade Center 7. Okay? The guys at Popular Mechanics conveniently forgot to show up and, write, and rewrite the story. Let's go to war for these guys, cousins. Let's listen to these guys, monkeys. If you haven't figured it out yet, you know, again, I'm sorry, I'm talking to the people who are, you know, on the web who might be new to this stuff, but I mean, come on with this stuff already. They're all playing from the same team. Anderson Cooper, youngest son of Gloria Vanderbilt. Fareed Zakaria with his buddy Kissinger, 360 degrees on CNN. Ooh, such an intellectual, blah, blah, blah. Daily, the Daily, Daily Show with Jon Stewart. Another Hegelian dialectic master, probably thinks he's really funny, total bonehead. But what's he there to? He's, the, he's there to release the tension on the court. Court jester, that's all. And most of my peers get their understanding of what's transpiring geopolitically from that guy. Full stop. Person of interest, new TV show, Bourbon Street, person of interest, interviewed, released. <laughs> police woman, police, woman in two heroin deaths, panicky. Then calm. Ooh. They're just, they're building the simulacra. And people don't, you know, they have no defense against it. White House issues bold climate change warning. Global March draws attention to climate change. We have our rock stars on the bottom left who are absolutely going to solve the problem. You can tell us by looking at them. Tens of thousands of activists walk through Manhattan on Sunday warning the climate change is destroying the earth. Destroying the earth. Let me tell you what would destroy the earth. If the Death Star like shot a laser like it did at Alderaan and the whole thing blows up, remember that? That's destroying the earth. Then I'd be nervous, okay? A little bit of climate change, there's no guarantee when you're born that the thing's gonna be totally stable, sorry. <laughs> and of course, no one ever mentions these taken outside my window in Boston. They really like to hit Boston with their lovely uh, contrails. Mark, these are contrails, I'm telling you. They're contrails, I'm telling you, man. Stop it. They're contrails. Shut up. This one's my favorite, Mom. This is what I get to be underneath when I'm hanging out. Pretty comes home. I refuse to put the air conditioning on in the middle of the summer when that shit's floating over the house. It is now 85 degrees, and I refuse to do it. I'm Italian, I can take the Mediterranean heat. So, uh, oh, Art, stop it. Again, it's in the eyes. Look at his eyes. Be positive, be quiet. Don't ever look at the dark. Don't ever find out what you're repressing. Don't ever deal with the dark psychological content. Don't resolve anything. That's what the, the masters, the social engineers want from us. Tuned up, not dealing with real anxiety, constantly anxious as a result, and afraid of what's happening externally. A permanent feedback loop, full stop. It's a beautiful architecture, right? And look at, uh, and Trinity Broadcasting Network has basically the exact same logo as the Queen. No social engineering here, just a coincidence. Look at this goon, man. Joel Osteen, God says have it all. Go get a Ferrari, but don't worry about the fact that you wanna break up with your girlfriend and you're really depressed. 
you know, and then, and then wander around spewing forth your own negative energy as a result. And then we all do that. You get the feedback loop and then, hey, look, it's World War III. They are tied. It is a feedback loop. There's a master-slave relationship. But these guys keep us slaves by telling us to go find a solution externally without cleaning internally. You don't have to worship Ayn Rand or anything, but this is a pretty damn good quote. Man is free to choose not to be conscious, but not free to escape the penalty of unconsciousness destruction. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending Mark Paxio's all-day seminar on 10-4. The sleeper has awakened. Thanks a lot. Have fun. I'm just going to watch now.